Okay, so let's get started. Um, the topic today is uh, taxonomy of writing systems and specifically about one aspect of the taxonomy, namely what's being called logography or logographic writing systems. So if you look at the history of the taxonomy of writing systems going back to uh, early work by Ignaz Gelb, um, in Gelb's system, uh, he had a very teleological view of writing systems. The idea was that things started off with, well, he had pre-writing, but then it, when he got to full writing, uh, he had this idea that, you know, systems were start out as what he called word syllabic systems. So ancient systems like Sumerian or Egyptian, uh, Chinese. And in those cases, you represented both syllables and some aspect of the word itself. And then you eventually dropped the uh, word aspect of it and just got syllables. And then finally you got alphabets. And he had, as I said, a very teleological view where you started with these word syllabic logographic systems. And then you evolved to the kind of the pinnacle of writing systems, which in his view was the alphabet. Well, a lot of researchers uh, since Gelb have taken a less teleological view. So if you look at, for example, at Samson's uh, uh, taxonomy in his 1985 book, uh, he separates writing into various categories where uh, he has, well, on the one hand, what he calls semasiographic writing systems. We're not really going to say anything about that. Then what he calls glottographic, which is just a fancy word for saying that it represents linguistic information of some kind. And within that, he splits systems into two branches, logographic, uh, which where the idea is that the, the, the writing system represents some aspect of the word, but not specifically the phonological information, more related to the to the word itself, the meaning of the word, and then phonographic writing systems. Okay, if you now look at De Francis uh, in his 1989 book, he uh, takes a slightly different view. Uh, he actually takes a lot of issue with uh, Samson's classification, and in particular, he makes the claim that there really is no such thing as a purely logographic system. All systems to uh, a, a greater or lesser degree also encode phonological information. In fact, he argues that you can't have a full writing system without uh, it also encoding phonological information. And so he his main divisions are actually uh, relate to the, the phonological information that's encoded in the system. So uh, he has syllabic systems or segmental systems. And within segmental systems, he has consonantal and alphabetic systems, so consonantal would be systems like uh, Semitic uh, writing systems. Alphabetic would, of course, be alphabets like Greek or Roman or whatever. And within each of these categories, he also has a, a further subdivision into what he calls morpho X. So a syllabic system could be morphosyllabic, or a consonantal system could be morphoconsonantal. Okay. And so the thing to notice here, right, is that he has these separate branches under each of the main phonographic branches. And uh, if you think about it, that really kind of suggests that this morpho X, which is his way of calling what we'll, we'll use the term logography here, but he calls it morphography, um, that within uh, the, the, the um, phonological uh, D divisions, the, the morphological divisions are really kind of a separate dimension, right? So these are basically each of the phonological branches has a uh, morphological or morpho, morpho, morphographic branch. And that kind of suggests really that morphography or logography is really a separate dimension. Okay. And so in my 2000 book, I actually took this idea and developed it into what I termed a planar uh, taxonomy, the idea being that really phonography or the kind of phonological information that's encoded is an orthograph orth orthogonal uh, dimension to um, logography, okay? And this idea was further developed by Rogers. We're gonna actually use Rogers' um, uh, scheme here. So the idea is, well, under phonography, you again have the kind of the familiar divisions. There's the uh, consonantal systems, also called abjads, alphabetic systems where all segments are, re uh, are represented, uh, abugidas, also called alpha syllabaries, which are, for example, uh, many of the writing systems of India uh, and Southeast Asia fall into that category. Moraic systems where you represent 
you know, either you know, sort, of, sort of simple syllables, basically, and then syllabic systems where you represent full syllables. Okay, so those are relatively easy to understand. On the other dimension is what Rogers terms amount of morphography. So he uses a similar terminology to, to Francis and what we're going to call here logography. Okay, but here, unlike the phonographic systems, it's not so easy to see how you would uh, kind of categorize these into separate categories. It seems more really that it's a matter of degree. That is, some systems are highly non-logographic. So a good example would be Finnish, where uh, in order to know how to spell a word in Finnish, for example, you just know how really just need to know how it's pronounced. It's almost completely predictable. And also going in the other direction, you, uh, if you know how to spell a word, you can also predict how to pronounce it very well. And then there are systems like, uh, for example, Chinese, where you know there's obviously, there is represent, as, as, as De Francis argued, there's clearly representation of phonological information, but there's also a lot of information that isn't phonological that's represented. Okay, so what is logography? I mean, we've used this term. Um, we've also, you know, noted that others use the term morphography. But you know, what is, what does this actually mean? Well, you would think. I mean, this is actually a, a very important concept in the uh, taxonomy of writing systems. All authors talk about it in one degree or another. But uh, oddly enough, it's not actually really very well defined in the literature. Now, the paper that you will have seen uh, that. Uh, is this talk is based on goes into more detail on this and I defend we defend that position here basically though if you look in the literature there's no nothing that really counts as a clear definition of what the term means but it does seem to relate to at least two issues and I'll just briefly uh, e exemplify these two concepts from English although one could give examples uh, from other languages and we we do in fact do that in the paper so one would be the idea that you know if you have different words even if they're pronounced the same they ought to be spelled differently. So for English, for example, you can see, you know, pair, pair, and pair. Those are homophones for most people, uh, but they are clearly, you know, different words and they have different spellings. So let's call that the distinct homophones idea, okay? Kind of the flip side of that is the idea that if you have the same morpheme, um, it should be uh, uniformly spelled, even if you have various kinds of morphophonological changes. So, for example, uh, if you take the uh, English morpheme telegraph, okay, uh, in the words telegraph, telegraphy, or telegraphic, well, in each of those cases, the pronunciation is slightly different due to stress shift and vowel reduction and so forth. Um, but they're all spelled the same. Now, if uh, you know, you know the old uh, sound pattern of English by Chomsky and Halley from the late 60s, you'll note that they they use the fact that English often spells things this way as an argument that English spelling is an almost perfect orthography for English because all morphemes are represented, uh, you know, each morpheme is represented consistently. Well, you know, it turns out that's not really true, but anyway, that was the idea. And it relates to this notion that we'll call uniform spelling. So these are both valid notions, and there may be others, but these these clearly are you know uh, get at some of the concept that people are trying to get at you know, when they use the term log log logographic. And so uh, in this talk, I'm going to just concentrate on one of them, namely the distinct homophones notion. We'll leave how to deal with the uniform spelling notion for future research. Okay, so to give an outline of the um, rest of the talk, I've already talked about taxonomies of writing systems and what some notions of logography are. I'll talk about one previous computational proposal for measuring the degree of logography, because you know basically the the idea again is that logography is not a categorical distinction; it's it's more of a uh, a matter of degree, and so that begs the question of how do you measure the degree to which something is logographic? Okay, I'm then going to propose three computational measures of logography of our own. I'll uh, report on some experiments and results uh, from that, and then. Uh, uh, Finally, we'll end with some conclusions. So the only previous computational measure um, of this that I'm aware of uh, is that work of Penn and Shoma from uh, you know, a number of years ago now, where they were trying to quantify the, the, this notion of degree of logography that I, that I spelled out in my 2000 book. But um, so there's a lot of math on this uh, slide. I'm not going to go into the math. I'm just going to basically describe um, what uh, their idea is. So they want to use um, basically correlation coefficients. 
And the idea is that if you look through a corpus of text that is divided into documents, and you look within each document, okay, logographic symbols, because they represent morphemes or words, they ought to be fairly what's often called bursty in their co-occurrence within a document. Why? Well, think about it. Uh, let's say you have a document about, uh, you know, that mentions the word cow. Well, you wouldn't be maybe surprised to see the word grass uh, in, 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 in somewhere in the same document. But, you know, um, carburetor, for example, would be an unusual thing to expect, right? It's just, uh, so, you know, the idea is that to the extent that logographic symbols represent something about the word itself, then uh, it, uh, the, it suggests that they, they ought to occur, occur with each other in a somewhat bursty fashion. You know, in one document, you'll have things that tend to uh, co-occur a lot because they are about that topic, and then some other document would be some other things, and so on and so forth. Whereas phonographic symbols, which are kind of devoid of any real meaning, they just represent uh, pronunciation, those should occur more uniformly. So the idea was that if you were somehow were to uh, plot the um, uh, the co-occurrence of uh, different um, morphemes, you would actually sort of see much more kind of washed out uh, co-occurrence with phonographic symbols and much more restricted and bursty co-occurrence with logographic symbols. So what do they actually do? Well, um, ideally you would like to have two systems where the, um, the, the different symbol systems are um, roughly the same size, whereas one's clearly logographic of the others clearly phonographic so they chose chinese as a good example of a logographic system um and they wanted to find a system that was like chinese in roughly the, having the same order of magnitude of symbols but was more phonographic uh they suggested using uh modern e uh and in case you're wondering what that is uh that's this is an example over here of uh, this is so E is a Tibetan Burman language spoken in um, I guess southwestern China and uh, it's uh, you know it uses a writing system which is basically a, a syllabary but it's a very large there's a lot of syllables in E so it ends up being a rather large symbol set but unfortunately uh, while Chinese corpora are easy to come by E corpora are not and so what they did is they simulated this by using what they call trigrammed English so the idea is that you uh, take English uh, uh, words, you divide them into sequences of three letters. So the word trigram, for example, would be T-R-I-G-R-A, and then M would be left over in the last, um, uh, as the last sort of trailing part of the, of the word. And each of those trigrams now becomes a, a, a letter. And the idea is that this would be a simulation of a, of a, of a larger phonographic system. Because if you just use English letters, obviously there are too few of those compared to Chinese characters. You want something on roughly the same magnitude. So they used two corpora. One was a Chinese news corpus. They didn't say which one, although I'm supposing it probably was one of the uh, you know, pen um, giga word corpora that, everybody uses and then the brown corpus which is a you know an old um uh, corpus of of uh, mostly american english uh, from the uh, late 1960s okay and here's what they show here's some plots which actually show the result that we described earlier on so the idea is that if you look uh, at chinese um the what you see what these are is basically um uh, 500 different uh, character types plotted by the same 500 different character types and you know forget the ignore the 2000 to 2500 here basically the idea is that each position ij is the ith character uh, matching with the jth character okay and obviously on the diagonal everything is correlated because everything correlates with itself so i always correlates with i obviously but what you notice here is kind of dark right i mean there's not a lot of um um uh, there's not a lot of co-occurrence here, and you do get some clusters around here, but for the most part, it's 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 fairly, uh, you know, dark. Whereas if you look at the phonographic system, for, you know, quasi or simulated phonographic system for English over here, or trigrammed English, you notice that uh, you know it's it's bright all over the place. So you get a lot of correlation. So that's kind of what you would expect. So we actually try to uh, replicate this using the Bible corpus, which is a large corpus of translated Bibles uh, into a bunch of different languages. And we took each chapter as a document, okay? And we tried to replicate, as I said, their, their result, and this failed, okay? Now, why did it fail? Um, well, first of all, let me show you that it fails. I mean, first of all, if you compare English and Chinese here, 
uh, you'll see that they're both pretty dark. There's not a lot of activity in either one. There's some cor correlation in places, but you know, it's it's pretty, you know, pretty similar plots. So what's going on? Well, basically, um, what this seems to have to do is is has to do with uh, mismatched document sizes in what uh, Penn and Shomer were doing. If you look at the brown corpus by design, uh, it has two hundred. Uh, sorry, two thousand words per document. And that works out if you assume a word length on average of about five characters for English. That works out to about four thousand of these uh, of these trigrams that they create. Okay. Now, if you look at a Chinese news corpus, again, they didn't say which one, but a uh, Chinese giga word is fairly typical of Chinese news genre. Um, this has about four hundred and fifty characters per document. Okay. So there's about an order of magnitude difference in the sizes of the documents. The Bible, on the other hand, is much more. Uh, even in the size, there are 1,100 trigram letters per document, that is chapter for English, and about 780. So that could well explain it, because obviously if you have a larger document, you're going to have much more chances of things co-occurring just because, you know, you, you, you got more samples. Okay, so uh, what we did then was we uh, we simulated their, their um, uh, uh, result by grouping for English, grouping six chapters into a document, that gives you about 6,600 trigram letters per document. And now you're, again, on an, roughly an order of magnitude more symbols than you get in Chinese. And lo and behold, here's the old plot I showed you. Here's the new plot. And if you I just toggle back and forth between those for a little while, you should see that we're getting a lot more activity. And this uh, seems to simulate their um, their result. So, um, in fact, you know, their result is not a result. It just means that they use mismatched document sizes. And, you know, just a general comment is, um, I, it's, it seems unlikely a priori that any measure that just based on the distribution of symbols is going to be very informative. I think you, you know, for any symbol system, you really need to know what the symbols don't uh, denote. And in this particular case, for this problem, one needs to somehow be able to relate them to pronunciation. So I'm going to now uh, turn to our own three proposals. Um, and there's uh, three. Um, the three are a simple lexical measure, uh, an entropic measure, uh, and an attention-based measure. And I'll describe each of those in turn. So the simple lexical-based measure simply looks at a dictionary. And the dictionary could well be uh, simply compiled from a corpus where you, for each pronunciation. Now we, so uh, let me just say uh, before I go on that we're going in each case here from the pronunciation to the spelling because again we're looking at this, um, you know, uh, distinct uh, homophones idea. So can I predict the spelling from the pronunciation? So I have a dictionary of pronunciations and associated spellings. That dictionary could be compiled from a corpus which has, you know. Uh, pronunciations and associated spellings. And that's in fact what we did, okay? And that simply going to count the number of um, spellings that I see for a given pronunciation. And there's a type and a token interpretation of this. The type interpretation simply says, you know, for each uh, in, uh, unique um, uh, pronunciation, how many different spellings does it have? And the token one balances that across the corpus by simply weighting it by uh, wait, waiting uh, each count by the by the number of pronunciations or number of instances of that pronunciation you see. Okay. Um, again, all of this is described in more detail in the paper, and um, I will I've, I will I have shared the slides or will share the slides uh, after I finish recording this. Okay. Uh, then there's an entropic measure. So entropy is an old idea that goes back to uh, work by Claude Shannon from the 1940s. Um, and the idea is that it's a measure of how surprised you should be if you are seeing a string of symbols and you then see the next symbol, how surprised are you? So in the, in the, in the case where you're maximally surprised, basically there's nothing about the previous stream that you can use to predict the next symbol, in which case it's, it's basically chaotic. It has maximum entropy. Whereas if, for example, to take... Um, uh, an obvious case, if I'm reading you the letters of the alphabet and I go A, B, C, D, E, you can tell me F with almost you know complete certainty, right? That means you're going to have minimal entropy. So uh, how does this play in here? So the idea is that uh, we want to look at the entropy of the um, phonological side and compare it with the entropy of the written side. The idea being that if, um, if the written side has... Um, is more logographic, right? If the system is more logographic, um, there should be 
more information in the context that would allow you to predict the next symbol because it just in, each symbol encodes more information right so you should somehow be less surprised by the next symbol than you would be in a phonographic system symbol uh, system okay so again there's a token and a type uh, interpretation uh, the token interpretation is uh, basically just subtracts the uh, computed entropy uh, from uh, of the uh, written uh, the written entropy uh, subtracts the uh, pronounced entropy from that, okay? All of these, by the way, are with respect to a particular language model. So what we actually do is we build a bigram language model of a fairly traditional kind and compute the entropy from that. So basically, we're looking at the difference in how predictable the written side and the, and the, pronounce, uh, and the pronunciation side are. Um, and in the case of, uh, the, there's a type interpretation which relates to the uh, mutual information between these two variables. Uh, and again, I'll, in, in the interest of time, I will uh, leave that to uh, the, you can look in the paper for more, more details. Finally, we uh, use an attention-based neural model. So uh, you know, natural language processing, computational linguistics is all moving to uh, neural uh, models these days. And so, you know, why not look at a, a neural model. So here's an example of an attention-based model uh, for uh, machine translation. So you imagine you're translating from English into French, and uh, you're going to basically have a bunch of observations of English words, and uh, those are going to get encoded in a certain way. Basically, they're going to be embedded into a high-dimensional embedding space, and then those are going to be fed into um, a context vector which has these trainable weights called attention weights, okay? And in addition to uh, each of the, to, to the input, we're also going to um, be looking at the previous uh, thing that we've predicted. So at the beginning of the sentence, you just predict this in the beginning of the sentence. Uh, uh, when you predicted the first word, let's say you correctly predicted je in this case, then you use that as, as, the, as the previous context and so on and so forth. And all of this gets put into a context vector, which gets fed into an attention vector, which eventually allows you to uh, predict a word, okay? So um, this is for machine translation. And actually the model that we use is very similar, uh, almost identical to this particular model, which I basically took from a standard uh, neural machine translation tutorial. Uh, in our case, the uh, input is phonemes. The output is written symbols, graphemes. And note that you can take these attention vectors, which are each of which is geared to a particular output position, and you can combine them into an attention matrix, OK? And uh, what that looks like, then, is this is for finish, where uh, this is on the, on the top axis here, you have um, pronunciation. And on the bottom axis, you have the spelling. And the, um, the basically, the brightness of the color in the red direction means the amount of activation. And what this is telling you is that uh, for finish, you can do very well uh, by simply uh, attending to, actually, in this case, just the current symbol, because you can always go one for one. I should say that for finish, um, since finish is so highly phonemic in its writing system, we basically just took the spelling with uh, you know removing capitalization, we just took the spelling as the as a, as a, as a proxy for the pronunciation. So these pronunciations are actually generated directly from the spelling. Um, so you know there are some minor cases where that doesn't work in, in Finnish, but you know for the most part this is reasonable. Okay, so uh, the one thing to bear in mind is we uh, enclose each target word uh, with these uh, special tags. And that's basically an indicator to the um, to the model to this is the word we want to pay attention to. This is the word we want to know how to spell. And this is very effective. The model is very good at picking these kinds of cues up. Okay, so it sees the whole sentence. It says, okay, this is the guy I want to pronounce. Oh, sorry, this is the guy I want to spell. And then it you know predicts the spelling. So now let's look at Chinese. So for Chinese, um, uh, we use we represent the pronunciation in in Pinyin. And uh, we represent, in this case, we're actually breaking the character down into, um, so there's this input system called Sangjie, which is basically structurally based. And so each char Chinese character has a Sangjie code, which is somewhat more granular, um, uh, kind of structurally based code for representing the, the character than just the, the single code point of the character. Um, so if you look here, the thing to notice is that things are much more spread out. The system seems to want to sp uh, spend uh, more uh, effort looking at things outside of just the word because 
on the basis of the pronunciation alone, it can't generally predict how to write a given symbol. Okay, so how do we actually use that? So imagine this is a completely random matrix. This isn't a real attention matrix, but imagine it look, you have an attention matrix that looks like this. Uh, what I'm interested in for the target word here, okay, I'm interested in finding out how much of the activation is within this, well, I should say, how much of the activation is outside of this relative to uh, the whole matrix. The idea being that the more outside uh, attention there is, the more logographic the system is, okay? Um, so basically you simply take this matrix, oops, sorry about that. Uh, you simply take this matrix, you uh, compute what's called the Hadamard product between it, basically just masking with this, and then you take, that gives you this, you then take the ratio of the activation of this to this, and that gives you the measure of logography, okay? So if it's highly uh, phonographic as in Finnish, you would get a, uh, something very close to, uh, to, um, to, to um, zero because almost nothing would be outside the, um, you know, the window of interest. Whereas if it's highly phonographic, uh, logographic, it should, you know, be very close to one or uh, in, in any case, much larger than zero. Okay, um, so let me just briefly go over the corpora and then I'll get to the results. Um, so we took, as we said, uh, as with what we reported before for the Penn and Choma simulation, we also use the Bible corpus here. And um, for uh, just a, most of it's fairly obvious. So we generated pronunciations using open source um, uh, tools, which are you know more or less good depending on what they are. So there obviously are, are issues with that. Um, we depended upon the uh, segmentation for languages where you know there is no white space segmentation like Chinese and Japanese. We depended upon the, either in the case of Japanese, we depended upon the segmentation that they gave. In the case of Chinese, they uh, actually gave it in two forms. So we considered both um, tokenized and untokenized. And I mentioned that we uh, used the Tsangjie encoding. So we either we actually used both the character encoding as the target and the Tsangjie encoding. So for Chinese, there's actually four possible variants. For Japanese, we uh, they only gave one tokenization. You can see an example down here, by the way. And if you know Japanese, you'll realize that this is actually pretty lousy. But anyway, this is the segmentation that you get out of the system. Also, unfortunately, gives you rather silly pronunciations in some cases. Um, so in Japanese, we again had two variants, uh, Tsangjie uh, for the kanji. Now, Tsangjie is not used to input Japanese at all, but you can encode a lot of the kanji using it. So when we could encode them, we did. And then also just uh, using uh, the straight uh, you know, character encoding. Uh, so uh, for Korean, we just looked at the individual Jamo letters rather than the full uh, syllable block. So the syllable block, there are you know many types of those, but those can easily and algorithmically be broken down into the individual letters, which is really what you're interested in. Okay, and then finally, um, uh, one other thing I wanted to note is for Hebrew. So um, unfortunately, the so as I'm sure everybody knows, the Hebrew Bible uh, is typically, uh, in fact, always uh, pointed. That is to say, it has diacritics, which represent vowels and other information about how to pronounce the text. Um, of course, it only is available for the Old Testament. The Bible corpus uh, Hebrew is actually available in both an Old and New Testament, but doesn't use any uh, diacritics at all. So we didn't use the Bible corpus there. We used this um, this version of the uh, from from this website of the um, of the uh, uh, pointed Hebrew Bible, the, the Bible with diacritics. Um, and from the diacritics, we actually generated two sets of pronunciations. Uh, one, a quasi-biblical pronunciation, and the other being a modern style pronunciation. Once you know the diacritics, the full diacritics on the words, you can pronounce, you can predict the pronunciation fairly reliably in Hebrew. There are some issues, but but for the most part, you can predict the pronunciation fairly reliably once you know all of the additional information to besides the, just the consonantal symbols, okay? Um, so that was the phonological side or the pronouncing, pronounced side. Uh, for the written side, uh, this may again seem a little counterintuitive, but the idea was we, we used the unpointed uh, text for the written side because when you're reading Hebrew, usually when you're not reading the Bible, if you're reading say a Hebrew newspaper, you don't have any points or diacritics at all. So the idea was that we wanted to use that for the for the written side. Now, one of the consequences of this is that modern um, Hebrew spelling is very conservative. 
who basically represents the biblical language. But modern Hebrew has a lot of um, phonological simplifications compared to biblical Hebrew. And uh, as a result, um, uh, you would expect that modern, you know, given a modern pronunciation, it's harder to predict this, what the spelling should be than given a biblical pronunciation. In other words, on the distinct homophones notion, a modern Hebrew should be more logographic. And we'll see that this is uh, by and large true. So actually, here's the results of the, uh, sorry, so this is, uh, sorry, this is not the results. So this is the, uh, uh, just a summary of the data. I won't bore you with this. I'll just get straight to the results, which is uh, the following. Okay, so this is a bunch of numbers here. I'll break this down in a second. Uh, one thing I do want you to notice is what I just said, though, is that biblical Hebrew should be uh, less homographic than modern Hebrew, uh, sorry, less logographic than modern Hebrew. And that seems to show, you know, if you look at the neural measures in particular, uh, that seems to be true. That is, uh, modern Hebrew has a higher uh, Me measure for these for these two neural measures uh, than biblical Hebrew, uh, and remember again that the higher the the value for the neural measure, the the uh, more logographic the system is deemed to be. Okay, so these numbers obviously a little hard to understand. So let's break things down. Uh, let's start actually with the simple measure, the lexical measure, um, and I want to. Th this is how the various languages are ranked according to this measure. So this is least logographic, most logographic. We'd like to have something to compare this to, though. Um, unfortunately, one of the problems in working in this area is there's you know, much prior work, so we don't really have anything that we can easily compare this to. So let's go back to uh, Roger's uh, classification, and let's um, uh, actually pick out some of the languages that we actually experimented with, Finnish, Korean, Russian, English, Chinese, and Japanese. And they are, in terms of logography in this order, in his... Uh, in his uh, ranking. Now, of course, this is all based on his intuitions as an expert on writing systems, but you know, they, they seem plausible. Finnish is certainly the least logographic. Japanese and Chinese are clearly the most, okay? And if you look at um, the lexical measures, getting back to what I just showed you, um, they actually look mostly pretty reasonable, but Korean's a bit weird. Um, Korean is being ranked uh, more phonographic than Finnish, and that seems counterintuitive because those of you who know Korean will know that there's you know quite a bit of morphological spellings in there that are you know hard to predict from the pronunciation. If you went back 150 years to how Hangul used to be used before everything got standardized into it, it was much more ph uh, phonetic uh, to use the sort of colloquial terminology, uh, and therefore probably would have ranked as much less logographic. But you know modern Korean spelling is quite um, morphophonological and therefore somewhat abstract. So it's a little surprising they show up as um, being uh, more, less logographic than, than even Finnish. Uh, if you look at entropic measures, well, by and large, they're even weirder. Uh, so it ranks Russian at being the least logographic if you look at the token-based measure. Um, and Korean is somewhat oddly more logographic than uh, English. Um, and then uh, over here, again, uh, in the type-based measure, somewhat better, but again, Korean is actually ranked as substantially more um, uh, phonographic than, than Finnish in this measure. So that seems odd. What if we now go to the tension-based measures? Well, uh, these seem to do somewhat better, okay? Uh, Finnish is where we would expect it to be. Um, English and Russian are, you know, a little bit odd in the ordering for the token-based system, but we actually perfectly replicate uh, Roger's intuition for the type-based uh, measure. Um, Chinese and Japanese, okay, there's a little bit of monkey business going on here because obviously Chinese and Japanese are kind of mixed mixed around here, okay? And the other thing to notice is that um, tokenized Chinese is actually ranking as significantly less logographic than the other versions, okay? And I'll get back to that uh, later on because that's actually an important point. But you know, by and large, uh, you know, Japanese on balance is, is, is with the exception of uh, Chinese where we're tr actually just predicting the, the character rather than the Tsangjie encoding. Uh, for Chinese, uh, putting that to one side, Japanese uh, comes out as the, at, at the top, okay? Okay, so we did some ad additional experiments. We got... Um, uh, we also looked at some higher quality Japanese data where we generated from an internal text-to-speech uh, text normalization system. And generally speaking, we got lower logography measures 
largely because we predicted larger tokens, okay? This also relates to the point about Chinese tokenized uh, text uh, that I'll get back to in, in a little later on. Uh, we also ran a uh, bunch of languages through uh, Epitran, which is a an open source um, kind of mixed quality pronunciation system. And uh, we, uh, you know, these these are a bunch of languages, most part except for Swedish, I guess, and Russian we had not previously treated. Um, but uh, for the most part, you know, uh, it's, you know, I guess re reasonably sensible. So um, Shona, for example, um, is, uh, which has a relatively recent orthography, counts as relatively, um, um, you know, non-logographic. The one surprise here might be Spanish. Um, I guess this is supposed to be South American Spanish pronunciation, um, which, um, shows up as being most logographic. So what's going on there? I mean, Spanish is, after all, considered to be uh, kind of the uh, the poster child, if you will, of, of a, a simple writing system, right? Where if you know how to uh, spell a word, uh, then you know how to pronounce it. But that's kind of actually the crucial point, right? Because uh, it's true that if you know how to spell a word, pronunciation is easy. In fact, Spanish even goes so far as to mark um, idiosyncratic stress positions with an explicit stress mark, which is, you know, obviously very helpful to the reader. But if you know how to pronounce a word, knowing how to spell it is not always necessarily so straightforward because it depends upon which word it is again, right? So these are these all count as homophones according to the Epitran data. Now, obviously, uh, you know, there are some stress differences, but that's actually ignored. Uh, in uh, Epitran, okay, so these, that's why, you know, Caso and Caso are not being uh, distinguished here. Obviously, there are dialects of Spanish in which all three of these would be distinct, Castilian Spanish comes to mind, but in many dialects of Spanish, at least these last two would be homophones and as, as would um, these two here, okay, Serra and Serra. Um, and um, so the point is that, you know, uh, Spanish is, easy to know how to pronounce, but there are, you know, issues with knowing how to spell it, that you actually have to know which word it is. So this is uh, presumably what this relates to here. Okay, so uh, let me just give some quick critiques of what we've done and uh, then uh, wrap up. Okay, so um, one critique is that we've simply redefined the notion of logography to be something that we can conveniently measure. Uh, I mean, there's some validity to that, I suppose, but it's rather hard to argue the point since obviously, as we've you know pointed out, the notion of logography has never really been well defined, okay? Okay, so that's uh, one objection. Another objection is, well, we've kind of missed the point anyway, because you know, if you look especially at ancient logographic writing systems, there are components of the writing that are clearly represent, you know, clearly represent the meaning and or some aspect of the meaning and not the pronunciation. So in, in, to give an example, which I like, right? Um, uh, you know, most Chinese morphemes are monosyllabic, but here's a case of a bisyllabic morpheme, the word pipa, which actually can mean two things. It can either be the Chinese lute or uh, the, the loquat, okay? Now, there's some speculation that, um, that, you know, one of these is derived etymologically from the other, which kind of makes sense. If you look at these two things, they look similar shape, if anything else, if nothing else. But uh, one of them is now written with this tree radical here, of the plant, and then the other one is written by what I'll call the musical instrument radical. These, um, you know, these this pair of symbols here, which on top of um, uh, at, when it's used at the top of a, of a character, often denotes some kind of musical instrument. Okay. Now let's say we removed one of these. Let's say we removed the this the Chinese lute version. We only had this. Obviously, according to our measures, the, system, the example would become non-logographic because you could always, assuming there's nothing else pronounced that way, you could always know how to pronounce to to spell this. But I mean, first of all, um, uh, you know, one point is that yes, this was true of ancient writing systems, and it's of course still true of Chinese today. But this is not uh, a critical to the notion of logography. So you know, Samson, um, and we discussed this more in the paper. You know, claims that English is at least partly logographic, and in indeed it does seem to show up that way in our in our, in our experiments. Um, furthermore, there are well-known cases, such as for example, um, in Middle Persian where uh, the language was represented using the Arama uh, you know, one or another Aramaic scripts where um, the, uh, it was quite common to actually take a, a word 
like the word for king, spell it the way it would be spelled in Aramaic. So something like Melek, okay, for you know typical Semitic base for the word for king. But it was in, clearly intended to be pronounced as if it were a Persian word. So something like Shah, okay. So in that case, I mean, that's clearly logography. I mean, everybody agrees on that. And that doesn't involve any of these kinds of components. So these components are not are not uh, critical. And the other point is that one has to consider the behavior of the whole system. Okay, if you take out one word, that'll change for that one word, but it wouldn't materially affect the behavior of the whole system. Whether something's logographic or not is really a measure about the whole system, not just one or two words. And obviously, you know, obvious point, right? All measures are sensitive to the data used. Uh, you know, the Bible isn't necessarily the best corpus to use uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, the pronunciation is automatically derived in all cases rather than being carefully curated by a human and so on and so forth. There are misspellings in the text uh, um, that, you know, uh, obviously skew results and so on and so forth. But that's, uh, that's true of any kind of uh, computational work or corpus-based work. Okay, so in summary, uh, we've presented three measures, uh, a lexical measure, an entropic measure, and an attention-based measure. And on balance, the attention-based measure, which looks and sees, you know, for an, a, a trained attention-based uh, neural model, uh, it looks and sees what aspects of the context the, um, the, the system has to look at uh, in order to figure out how to spell a given word. And basically, does it have to attend to stuff outside the immediate context of the word you're trying to spell? Um, and that seems to uh, give a somewhat a satisfying result, at least vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, for example, um, Rogers' uh, ranking of languages according to their degree of logographic-ness. Uh, okay. Uh, one point that I hinted at a couple of times before is, uh, as we noticed, the uh, tokenized Chinese uh, case is, um, you know, much less logographic than the other versions. And how logographic a system is really depends upon what you take the target to be, right? So, for example, if you take the syllable D in uh, the Chinese Bible, that could be any of six different characters. But if you take the pair of syllables, Tian Di, uh, heaven and earth, it can only be written in one way, okay? So if you have larger units, you get, you know, the system seems less logographic because it's more certain. You can tell with less looking at the context to figure out what you should be doing. We also saw this in the case of the uh, uh, the second Japanese experiment I reported, where we had we noticed that it was less logographic because there was there was uh, larger tokens. Anyway, uh, putting all of this to one side, um, I'd like to end by noting that. Uh, a lot of these kinds of notions that are vague in the literature could be made more specific, maybe not in ways that everybody will be happy with, but can nonetheless be made more specific by proposing specific computational measures. And by doing so, you uh, come to a better understanding of what a term like logography actually means.